Okay. Okay. So, um, first of all, just something I I've been thinking about that I'm going to try, and that's um. Remember, we made groups on the first day, and you know we're keeping those groups for now. But then. Probably starting next week, what I'm going to do, and I'll do this every so often during the quarter, is I'll give everybody a form. And on that form, you can just mark whether you want to stay in the group you're in or if you want to make a change. So that way, if you know a group is happy and they're working well together, they can stay together. But you know, if someone in the group wants to change for whatever reason, sometimes people just want to change to meet other people. You know, it's nothing against the person that they're grouped with. You know, other times, you know, something different. Yeah. But whatever the reason, you don't have to put the reason. Um, you just mark that you want to change groups. And then, you know, the people that want to change, I'll try to accommodate them. You know, and if, and if people want to stay the same, they, they can just stay with their group for it. Okay, so I, I haven't done this before. We'll just see how it works out. I suppose there would be a problem if there's just one person in one group that wants to change. <laughs> so nobody else wants to change, right? I guess I would just have those two people Go by themselves if they want. Uh, but anyway, we'll try. But for right now, just stay in the group you're in. Okay. okay. Another thing I just want to mention, and you know, people that have had me in a class before already know this, but not everybody has been in a class of mine before. So I quite typically do this. I'll write stuff on the board before you come to class. Sometimes it's not much, like last time. Remember, I didn't have that much on the board at the start. But then other times there's quite a bit, like today. And um, I, I do that mainly as an overview for myself so I know what to talk about and you know what order and try not to forget things that you know are important. You know, some people like it, some people don't. Um, because you know, the people that don't like it, usually they say something to the effect of, oh, I come to class and there's all this stuff on the board and I feel like I'm behind. Well, uh, you can take pictures of what I have up here, either at the beginning or at the end. I'll leave this up here once I'm done. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is whatever I have up on the board at the start is a different color than what I write during the class. And I do that on purpose just so I know what to erase before my next section. Because <laughs> if I have everything the same color, I'll uh, erase stuff I didn't mean to erase that I wanted up there. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out that um, you're more than welcome to take pictures of what's up on the board at, at any time. Okay? It's just... Uh, you know, I have another section at three o'clock today. So towards the end of this section, whatever I have in black, I will erase before that section. But I'll let, I'll let everyone know. I'll give like, you know, a five minute warning. I'll say, hey, if you want to take a picture of the board, do it now because I'm going to erase this stuff in black. Okay. All right. So um, also remember during the first meeting, I, I mentioned how, you know, once I'm done lecturing, then you have in class time to work on the assignment. Now. The first meeting, I think I lectured for about two hours. Okay, today, it shouldn't be anywhere close to two hours. It probably won't even be an hour, probably be around an hour or so. So you, you should have the last two hours to work on the next assignment, which is the first uh, hardware assignment, okay, hardware one. And, and I'll go over um, you know, what you need to do for that assignment, what you need to turn in. What you turn in for hardware one is different. The criteria is different than what you turn in for the rest of the hardware assignment. And I'll, I'll mention exactly you know, what you need to turn in. Now, most of today's lecture is gonna be review material. Okay? There's some things from CP 133 that you need for this assignment. And also there's things from the first meeting that I just wanna go over again because it's involved in this assignment, okay? Okay, so first of all, uh, from CP 133, you talked about inputs that were active high or active low. So who can tell me what active high means? Like if I have an active high reset, what does that mean? What does the active high mean? I think it's more than the signal is high, it's going to be on. Right. That it, if any active high input you have, in order to make that input active, you need a one, you need a high. 
So if you have an active high reset to make the reset happen, that reset input has to be a one. Uh, what does reset mean? Like if you reset something, what happens? Yeah. Right, the output goes to zero. So, you know, reset any output, reset means that output goes to zero, okay? So your active high, like we said, it takes a one, make that input happen. An active low, it takes a zero. Okay, then also in CD133, we have these acronyms. RAT and FET. Now, FET and electronics are something else. Uh, but in the digital world, what does RAT and FET stand for? What does FET stand for in the digital world? Okay, that's RAT, right? right? And then this one's what? Exactly. This is rising edge, trigger. This is only. Okay, so what's a rising edge? Like on this clock signal here, this square wave, where's the rising edge? Um, on the left side of each uh, upper, or each. So right every, time, every time it turns into a one, it's the left side of that. Right, so it's the transition from zero to and the falling edge is the transition from one to zero. Okay, the trigger just re refers to edge sensitivity. Okay, like flip flops are edge sensitive, right? They're either sensitive to the rising edge or they're sensitive to uh, the falling edge. And remember, registers are made out of flip flops, right? And flip flops and registers are memory devices, which are sequential circuits, right? Remember in 133, we have sequential circuits which have a clock in memory. And we have combinational circuitry that doesn't have a clock and doesn't have a memory. All right, so that's a quick way you can tell whether you have sequential or combinational to see if it has a clock input. All right, then we get to asynchronous and synchronous. What's the difference between these two? And some inputs are asynchronous, right? You can have like an asynchronous reset, some are synchronous. Uh, asynchronous happens with the clock and asynchronous happens whenever. Exactly. Uh, asynchronous does not depend on the clock signal. Synchronous does depend on the clock signal. So for example, if you have an active high synchronous reset, it's not enough for that reset input to become a one to make the reset happen because you not only need the one, you also need an edge of the clock. And if it's rising edge, you need the zero to one transition of the clock to happen when that active high reset is a one, right? If it's falling edge, you need the one to zero transition of the clock to happen while that active high reset to the one in order for the reset to happen. Okay, if it's asynchronous, as soon as that active high reset becomes a one, it's gonna get reset, the output's gonna go to zero. Okay, so just as an example, because it's very important in this class to understand the difference between asynchronous and synchronous because in this order, right, this microprocessor you're gonna be building, um, some of the reads, Okay, which is getting data. Some of the reads are synchronous and some are asynchronous. And then the writes, okay, when you're putting data, storing something, uh, all the writes are synchronous. Okay, so that's why it's important to know the difference. So if we look at this example, and we get this clock signal, remember a clock in the digital world is just a periodic square wave. And let's say that this reset is active high active high and it's synchronous. And let's say also that uh, we're looking at the uh, rising edge. Okay, this is some device that's rising edge. Period. And the output here is starting at a one. And remember, like we said before, what reset means is that when it's activated, the output's gonna go to zero. Okay, so if this is active high synchronous. At this time here, 
when the reset becomes a one, right, right here, the reset goes from a zero to a one. So at this time, what would happen to the output? Would the output go to zero or would it stay at one? If it's an active high synchronous. Right, why would it stay at one? Because it needs to go as far as the end. Right, because see, at this time here, we don't have a rising edge of the clock, right? This reset went to a one after this first rising edge. So it's not until this rising edge occurs that now, assuming the reset stays a one, so at this time here, when the reset is one and you have the rising edge, that's when that's when the outputs go to zero. Right? The synchronous inputs, they don't only require the active value, they require the edge of the clock too. Now, if this was an asynchronous active high reset, well, then it would get reset here, right? Because if it's asynchronous, it doesn't depend on the clock. The minute that reset went to its active value of one, the output would go to zero, right? If it was asynchronous. And we see that's the difference between asynchronous and synchronous. Okay. Like I said, this is going to be important because that otter has some inputs that are synchronous and it has some that are asynchronous. Okay. All right. So that was um, that's material from CP133 that you're going to see is um, important to this particular assignment, but it's important for the whole quarter too, but in particular to the uh, hardware assignment number one. Okay, also, this assignment you're going to uh, begin once I'm done lecturing. Some things from our first meeting are important uh, to go over again. Okay, and one of those is we talked about how the otter memory is organized. Right, it organizes 32 bit words that are byte addressable. So I had this diagram on the board last time, and I just want to go over it again, okay? So what this diagram is showing is every row is 32 bits. So we have 32 bits here, 32 bits here, 32 bits here, and it goes from an address of zero, of zero all the way to an address of all Fs, right? So there's a bunch of, um, of rows and then within each 32-bit row, I have four squares. Again, just imagine these are squares. Some of them look like rectangles, but we have four squares. And each square has a byte, which is eight bits. So 32-bit row, four eight-bit bytes, right? Four times eight, 32. So each byte has an address. That's what this byte addressable means. So this byte has address zero, this byte has address one, this byte has address two, address three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, because A is 10 in hex, right? B is 11, C is 12, B is 13, B is 14, F is uh, 15. Then it goes one zero, because that's 16 plus zero, then one one, because that's 16 plus one. Okay, so, you know, that's one of the things in this class. We use hex all the time, right? So. You're a little fuzzy on hex, right? Base 16, so have to do some review. Okay. So each byte has an address. <clears throat> now we talked about where the word addresses are, right? Because the word addresses address 32 bits. So do you remember where the word addresses are? Like what's my word address for this bottom row? Okay, for word addresses, you're using the furthest to the right in this diagram, the furthest to the right uh, byte address. So you see address zero, all zeros. That's the word address. And then my next word address would be four. Now I'm not going to write all the zeros. Take some time again. Okay, then I have eight as a word address. That would be the next one. Okay, 
And then address 12 to see it happen. And then address 0010. And then 16 in hex and so on. This would be 20 in hex. This would be 24. Okay. So the word addresses are these addresses here. Okay. So in the instruction set, okay, remember last time we talked about that each micro each microprocessor has its own unique uh, listing of instructions, and we call that the instruction set architecture. Okay, that's what ISA stands for. And if you look in the instruction manual, right, the assembly language instruction manual, again, I have a hard copy of it here, but the electronic form is on uh, Canvas. And it has all the instructions with all the detailed information. Well, if you look at the instruction set, you'll see that there's instructions like load word, uh, load half word. In fact, you use load half word in the first uh, software assignment, right? There's also a load byte. There's also store instructions, right? Because again, a load is like a read, a store is like a write. So there's a store word, and there's a store half word, and there's a store byte. So if you're using either a load word or a store word, store word, the address that you would use in that instruction would be a word address. Like the only instruction, or excuse me, the only addresses that you can use in either a load word or a store word are 048C1014 and so on. Now, if you're using either a load byte or a store byte, well, then you can use any byte address, right? The byte address, byte address, all the squares have byte address. Now, if you're using a load half word or a store half word, and how many bits is a half word? 16. Well, if you're using either a load half word or a store half word, the addresses that you could use are zero, because if you use either a load half word or store half word with address zero, it's going to take these two bytes. If you use address one with either, either a load half word or store half word, it's going to use these two bytes. If you use address two with the load half word or store half words, it's going to use these two bytes. But what you can't do with either a load half word or store half word is use it's furthest to the left byte. Like you couldn't have either a load half word or store half word with the address three because what it would try to do, it, it would try to take these two bytes. But the way the hardware is designed, you cannot cross a word boundary. They okay? would call it crossing a word boundary. And, and that's an example of crossing a word boundary is if you use this address for a half word, or uh, excuse me, a load half word or store half word, it would try to go across this word boundary, right? Because this byte is part of this word and this byte is part of the other word and that's what's meant by crossing the boundary, okay? Okay, so um, the next thing. Also last time we talked about that there's this module of the otter that's labeled reg five. And one of the handouts I had in that packet of three pages that I gave you uh, during meeting one, it showed how many registers were in that reg five. Right? And it showed their names. Right? It had like X0, X1, X2, and so on. And it also had alternative names like zero register, stack pointer, and some others. And I said, don't worry about the alternative names yet. We're, we'll worry about that later. But how many registers are in that reg file? You don't know, you could just look at that page. 32, right? Because we have X0 through X31. Right. Remember last class, I said for now, don't use the first five registers. Don't use X0 through 
through export because those are specialty registers that you know we'll learn more about later. So in any assignment, only use registers X5 through X31 for now. Okay, but like you said, there's 32 registers in that reg file. Well, if I have 32 registers, how many address bits would I need so that each register has its own unique address, its own unique zeros and ones? In fact, if you have 32 of anything, right, in the digital world, how many bits do you need to represent 32 values? Or how would you figure it out? What, what if you had four values? How many bits would you need to represent four values? I mean, how many binary? Two, right? All right, if I have two bits, I can have value zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, right? How about if I have three bits? Eight, right? We could have zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, one. So we need five bits. Right. So for 32, you would need five bits. Right. I'm sure you saw this formula in 133, right? Two to the number of bits, right? The number here is bits equals the number of values. Right. So I have two bits, four values, three bits, eight values, four bits, 16 values, five bits, 32 values. Okay, so those reg files, or excuse me, those reg file registers, right? The 32 of them, they have five bit addresses. Now, these registers that make up memory, those have 32 bit addresses. Okay, but the reg file has five bit addresses because there's only 32 registers. Right, there's a whole bunch of registers here. And you can figure it out, right? You can figure out how many bytes you have from zero to all Fs and then divide by four, right? And that'd be how many rows for each of the registers, the 32 bit registers. Okay. Um, also, last time, we talked about how the otter memory is segmented, right? There's certain address ranges that are used for certain things. That's what we mean by segment. So the entire memory goes from address zero to all uh, Fs that you see here. But between these two ranges, from zero to uh, all zeros and five FFF, that's where your program is stored. That's what we mean by the code segment. This is where your uh, instructions are. Okay, then you have this range of memory for data. Then this range here for what's called the stack. Now we'll talk about what the stack is like a month from now. That's not for a while. Okay, then you have some ranges that aren't used. And then you have this range here, uh, MMIO. What does MMIO stand for again? We talked about it last time. Memory map IO. Right, memory map IO. Remember what's meant by memory map IO is that as far as your microprocessor is concerned, as far as this otter is concerned, an input device like switches is known by an address, right? An output device like LEDs are known by an address. Okay, that's what memory mapped IO means. Okay, now, this is something we didn't talk about last time. This portion, of the otter memory. So this portion that includes the code, the data, and the stack, this is called real memory. Okay, it's just a term that we give for these three segments. And what we mean by real memory here is that this memory, this portion of the otter memory is located in this module. This module that we call memory that's part of that diagram of the auto. See, the memory mapped IO is not part of real memory. 
Okay, we'll talk more about MMI external data. It's coming from, again, input devices are going out to output devices. Okay, but the, the key thing here, MMIO is not part of real memory. Now, this address range from real memory that goes from all zeros to 000, zero, zero F, 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 these limits, okay, these address limits of real memory are set by the basis board. Okay, the basis board, what you're going to be using, okay, when you eventually get this all together, right, you get this modern CPU all together. Well, in the FPGA on the basis board, there's only a certain amount that you can use of it for memory. Okay, and that certain amount corresponds to these address limits. So the address limits of real memory are set by the hardware, okay, specifically the basis FPGA. But these address limits, okay, the address limits that we use for the code and the address limits that we use for data and the address limits that we use for the stack, those are determined by the program. Okay, it's not determined by hardware. I'll get to your question in just a second. Um, so I think I mentioned last class that, you know, the people that developed the Otter along with the instructions that go with it, Dr. Kalinas, um, Dr. Benson, uh, Dr. Hummel, uh, I don't want to miss anybody, Dr. Mealy, they decided on these ranges for these, you know, these address ranges for those three segments. Okay, but again, the real memory address range, that was determined by the basis board. You've had a question? Yeah, so, if you can confirm that I understand this correctly, this means it has uh, uh, eight, uh, eight, eight, eight. Close. Uh, well, first of all, first of all, you talk about real memory. Yeah, yeah. If you talk about real memory, the number of bytes would be two to the sixteen. Okay, that's number. That would be the number of bytes that you could store. But if we're talking instructions or other data that's thirty-two bits, you would do what to that number? Because this would be bytes. Uh, Close. How, how many bytes in 32 bits? Oh. Divide by four. So, yeah, if you're using all of this, say for instructions, right? Say this was all code, then yeah, you could, uh, it would be 16K. Okay, but we're only using a portion of that. I think you could figure out uh, how many 32 bit words you can store in this address range, I think it comes up to 6K. You know, and the reason why, well, again, it was decided by those four doctors. And I would assume they chose that narrow range because for what we do in this class, you're probably not gonna come anywhere close to 6,000, you know, 6K, which would be a little bit more than 6,000, right? In the digital world, right? Everybody remember that from another CP133 that in the digital world, a K is not a thousand even, right? What's a K in base 10 or base 2? 1024. 1024, right? Because that equals 2 to the 10. So when you say 16K in the digital world, that's 16 times 1024, not 16,000 uh, even. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, when we get to the full fledged otter um, and you know, the number of instructions in Verilog that you have to write, it, it's probably. Well, it's nowhere close to that, but but that would have to do with the assembly language program that you come up with to program the otter at the end, which is going to be much less than that. So it will be, yeah, because um, because we lost two classes, you know, one to a holiday, one to the storm. Um, yeah, there's some things I'm going to have to cut out at the end, which is going to make what you can do for the project, you know, a little simpler. Uh, well, right now it's it's not on there, but I mean, I, I could put it on there if somebody wanted it, sure. Okay, so um, 
The next thing to talk about is just a little bit about this memory module. Okay, again, this is one of the hardware pieces uh, that's part of the otter. And the memory module, that's where real memory is located. Okay, so real memory is this memory store. And you can see there's a bunch of inputs here. You know, here's an input address two, input data into address one, read enable one, read enable two, write enable two, the I sign, this is I O N, I O uh, writes. And then it has these other two outputs, D out two, D out one. Now, eventually we'll get to what all these inputs and outputs, uh, you know, what their purposes are. But for the discussion right now, and just to give some overall understanding to what you're going to be doing in hardware, uh, the hardware one assignment, we're just going to concentrate on this input address one and this output uh, DO. So if you look at the otter diagram, address one is a memory module, memory module, it connects to the program counter output. Now the program counter, we're going to talk about in detail next class. Okay, so Tuesday of next week, um, we're going to talk in detail about the program counter. But for right now, okay, just to have a, a kind of like a big picture understanding of some of what you have to do for uh, the hardware one assignment. For right now, at the output of the program counter is the address of the instruction to be executed. Okay, so see inside the memory module is the real memory that contains the segment that has the instructions of the program that you're gonna run. Well, coming into address one of the memory module from the program counter is the address of the instruction that's going to be executed. In this read enable, a R D enable one, it's active high and it's synchronous. So when this read enable one becomes a one, and then okay, and, and the memory module is rising edge trigger. Oh, actually, I have to point out, what's this little uh, triangle indicate? What input is this? That's the clock, right? This little symbol means clock, right? Which you should expect, right? Because memory has flip flops, right? It's a memory device, so it's sequential, so it's gonna have a clock. So when this read enable one is equal to a one, so it's active high, and when it's a one, you get the zero to one transition of the clock. What's going to happen is that the instruction that's located at this address that's on the address one, it's going to be at the out one. The D out will have the instruction. that has its address on input address one. Okay, so you see the program counter is providing the address to the memory module. When read enable is one, along with the rising edge of the clock. So at the time the clock goes zero to one while read enable is one, the instruction that's located in this address is going to be here at D out one. And then D out one connects to the reg five. Okay, if you look on the diagram, you'll see that D out one goes to like three different inputs on the reg five. Now, you know, like I just said, we're going to talk about the program counter in much more detail uh, Tuesday of next week. We're going to talk about the reg file in uh, much detail Tuesday of the following. Okay, 
But for right now, I just wanted you to know how this memory, if we're talking about memory, how it kind of fits in between those two things. Okay. So, as we talked about, memory has 32 bit words right, in each row. Each row has a word address. And then, how many bits are our instructions? Talked about this last time. If you look at the instruction manual, I right, look at any instruction starting on page 18, I go to page 50. Right? And in the description, it gives you the machine code for that instruction. How many bits does these instructions have? 32. Okay, so in your code segment, each instruction is a row. Each instruction is a word. So your instructions have word addresses. See, your first instruction is going to have address zero. Your next instruction is going to have address four. Your next instruction is going to have address eight, and so on. Each instruction is separated in word address by four. So you see what we're going to talk about on Tuesday of next week, is that once an instruction is executed, this program counter output is going to increment by four, right? So if the address, or excuse me, if the instruction at address zero has just been executed, well, after that instruction at address zero gets executed, the output of this program counter is going to go to four, right? Because that's where the next instruction is. And then when that instruction gets executed, the program counter output is going to go to eight. And then it's going to go to C, right? Twelve. So you see the program counter increments by four, right? And that's because the instructions in memory are separated by four, okay? All right, so um, the next thing is to start talking about the actual assignment that you're gonna start working on. But before I do, are there any questions up to this point? Now, again, we're gonna get into more detail about the program counter. Okay, we're going to get into more detail about the right file, but this is kind of how the, the memory fits in between. Okay, well, the good news is uh, for this assignment coming up is that both the Verilog code that you need for the memory module and also the Verilog code for the program. Now, what the program is, is that's the memory. Uh, specific to the code segment. So this entire real memory is within the memory module. Then within the memory module, there's another module, like sub-module, if you will, called the program that specifically has the codes. Okay, that's where the instructions are. Okay, the instructions are in this program, which again is part of the memory module. Okay, like the memory module has more stuff, right? So the, the program is kind of like a sub module of the memory module. Well, we provide, or I say we, Dr. Hummel provides uh, these modules. He designed them. Okay. Now, the memory one you're not going to need till later. The one that you need for this assignment, hardware number one, is the program. Okay, and it's in system Verilog. That's why you see the uh, uh, suffix of uh, SV here. But this is on Canvas, all right? So you're just going to download this from Canvas and, and use it. Okay. All right. So hardware assignment number one. Now I talked about this last time. Also, remember how I said that on Canvas, there's the criteria for the software assignments, right? And there's the uh, criteria for the hardware assignments. Well, hardware number one has different criteria than the other hardware assignments. Okay, it's the only one that's different. Okay, after hardware number one, you know, hardware number two onward, it's all the criteria that's on Canvas. And then for all the software assignments, it's the criteria on Canvas. But this is the one exception. Okay, it has different criteria that I'm gonna talk about, okay? 
So this is what you need to do in order to complete hardware number one. The first thing you need to do, and I put this handout on uh, the bench. Everyone should have this handout that I'm going to show you. Okay, this handout here, okay, it has a table at the top. Okay, everybody should have this. Okay, well, the first thing to do for this assignment is you want to make a table just like the one that's at the top using this hex listing that's, that's in the middle of the page. So first, let's look at the table at the top. Okay, look at the far left column, prog ROM addresses. It goes 0, 4, 8, C, which is 12, right? 1, 0, which is 16, 1, 4, which is 20. Why are they incrementing by 4 like that? Yeah, that's what we were talking about over here. That says each instruction is 32 bits. We're using the word addresses that go by 4s, right? 0, 4, 8, and so on. Okay, okay then. The middle column, what this is showing in the table, is this is the instruction at that address in machine code, right? Machine code is all zeros and ones. And then the far right column, that's showing the assembly instruction that goes with that machine code. Okay, remember I just said a little while ago, right? In this instruction, uh, right? That, um, Assembly language instruction manual for each instruction, there's a 32 bit machine code that goes with it. Okay, so the table shows the address of the instruction, it shows the instruction and machine code, and then it shows the assembly language instruction. So, what you're going to do, the first part of this assignment, what you're asked to do is to take this program. Okay, the one in the middle, which is different than the one that's up here. You want to take this program that shows the instructions in hex. See this uh, address or the instruction at address zero, this 0640493. That's a hex number. Okay, along with all the other hex that you see here. It's the hex for an instruction. So the first thing we want you to do is we want you to take those instructions that are in hex and convert them to binary because then that's the machine code for that instruction. And remember, we talked about this last class as part of the CPE 133 review last class. Remember, we talked about how you can easily go from base two to base 16. Right, if I have I have a binary number like this. How can I easily pick that and go to X? What would I do? Group the bits in groups of four. Yeah, we group the bits in groups of four, starting with the least significant like this, right? And then what do you do? Convert each one to X. Right, you just take each four bit grouping and write the hex character. So what would I write here? Nine. Nine, one zero zero, one is nine. Are you confident with that one? Yes. Yeah, here yes. it is. Everybody see why it's D? Because 1101, what, what number is that in base 10? 13, and 13 is D and X. Okay. Well, not only can you go from binary to hex easily, you can go the other way easily, right? Because if you're going from hex to binary, you're just writing each hex character as a four bit binary grouping. Okay, so you see, that's what you need to do first. Take these instructions that are in hex and convert them to binary. So that's going to be your middle column. Okay, then the next thing is you need to get the assembly instruction for that machine code. And that's where you have to look at that manual. Okay, this is where you need to get this assembly language instruction manual. Okay, and like I said before, each assembly language has a 32-bit machine code. Now, to give you some helpful pointers on this, 
the first thing you would want to look at once you have your machine code for your instruction, the first thing to look at is the last seven bits of that machine code, because the last seven bits are what we call an op code. And the reason to look at that first is because also in your instruction manual, before the detailed description of each instruction, there's these listings of different types of instructions. See, there's some instructions that are called R type. They're called R type because they have to do with registers. There's some instructions that are called I type. They're called I type because they have to do with immediates. What are immediates again? We talked about that last time. In assembly language, what does immediate mean? They're constants. Yeah, it's just a number, just a constant. All right, remember you had load immediate and you were loading the address of the switches because you're just treating that address like a number. Um, then there's S type, which are your store instructions. There's B type, which are branch instructions that we're going to talk about next week. Uh, there's U type, there's J type. Well, these different types of instructions have different op codes, and the op codes are the last seven bits, okay, the least significant seven bits. So that's where you want to start because you know, if you look at the R type instructions, they all have the last seven bits the same. And that's different than the I type instructions, which is different from the other type of instructions. So the op code will get you to what type of instruction it is. Then once you have the type of instruction, if you look at bits 12 through 14, those will be different for the different same type of instruction. Okay? So then once you have the instruction, some of these instructions, like say you have um, an add instruction. If you have an add instruction, it's going to take the contents of two registers. Okay, one's RS1, one's RS2. The S stands for source. So if it's an add instruction, it's going to take the contents in each of these source uh, registers, add them together, and then put the result in a destination register, which is RD. Well, your source registers and your destination registers, they're inside the reg file. Okay, so they're going to be uh, you know, one of those 32 registers. And how many address bits are there again for 32 registers? Five. Five. So when you look at the detailed description and you look at these instructions that have source registers and destination registers, well, look, here's five bits for RS1. So that's going to be the address for the register that's being used in the reg file. Same thing for RS2, five bits. That's an address for that source register. Same thing for the destination register. Okay. See, the reason it's five bits is because that's the address for those registers. Okay. And then if you have an instruction that has an immediate, um, like say this add I, that's adding an immediate, which is just a number, to a content of a register, and then putting the results in another register. Again, where the result goes is the destination register. If you're using a register as part of an operation, that's the source register. Well, if there's an immediate involved, you're going to see that in the 32 bits, there's going to be bits that are assigned to the immediate, and that's where your immediate value is. Okay? So the whole purpose of the first part of this assignment is to get you to look at this. It's just to get you to start looking at, hey, there's these different ways that we can distinguish between these different instructions. And once we get into the particular type of instruction, there's ways to tell between those instructions of the same type. And then within the machine code is the information, you know, the address for the registers that are going to be used. The intermediate value, if there is one, it's all within that machine code. Okay. All right, so that's the first part of this assignment. Now, before you start the rest of it, okay, this is all done manually, all right? So when you create that table, you know, create it in Excel, right? But you're doing it all manually, okay? Okay, the rest of this is on either RARS or Vivado, okay? So once you're done with this, before you start the rest of it, I have a video on Canvas, okay, for this meeting. If you go to the meeting, Right, you'll see there's a video and I show you exactly what you need to do. Okay, in this video, I show you how to create a mem file in RARS. And what the mem file is, that's a file that's gonna have the instructions 
that you want to run on the otter. So when you go to program the otter, you do it through this mem file. Okay, and, and the video will step you through how to generate that file. Okay, also in the video, once you have the mem file created in RARS, it shows you how to input that mem file into Bavado. And it's no different than any other file. You know in Bavado how you can add files, right? Well, the same way you add a design file into Bavado is how you add a mem file. It's no different. It's, it's very easy to do. In fact, you'll see it's very easy to generate a mem file in RARS also. It's like two steps. Okay, then the next thing in the video is I explain some of the code that's in this prog run okay, that you're going to use. Because you'll see some, there's some Verilog, you know, system Verilog that you didn't see in 133. Okay, so I explain basically what you didn't see in 133. There's also some things in that file that you should recognize. Okay, I also show you the code that you need for the test venture simulation. Some people call it test venture, some people call it simulation. Okay, but you're gonna run a simulation and I give you the code that you need. Okay, so what I would do when you get to that part of the video is I would take a screenshot of it and then you can just type it into the body. I also show you how you can look at Remember um, the first part of doing the table is you have this hex listing of the instructions. Well, in Vivado, it will show you the hex listing for this mem file that you created. Okay. And that's a good way to check to make sure that the mem file was created uh, correctly. Right. Because if the mem file doesn't agree with this, then Something, you know, something happened in between. Okay, but if your mem file looks like this hex listing, that means it's good. Okay, and then the last thing in the video is I show you what a successful simulation looks like. Okay, what the timing diagram looks like. Okay, so what you turn in for this assignment, like I said, this is the only assignment that's different than the others, are these three things. You want to turn in this table that you manually produce. You want to turn in this hex listing of instructions that you get from Vivado. Okay, this hex listing has to be from Vivado, not something that you type. Right? Because again, the reason why it's got to come from Vivado is because that's verification that you did the mem file correct. And then the third thing is uh, a copy of the simulation uh, timing diagram. Okay, so that pulls simulation time you diagrams. So, you know, these should all be hard copies. I, I don't want a file, like I don't want you to turn in the mem file, right? What you can do is take a screenshot of this listing, take a screenshot of this tiny diagram, put it into a Word file along with that table and then turn it into a PDF. And then just turn in a single PDF. Actually, Blake's black too. Does that sound good, Blake? Sounds good. All right. Yeah, I like it. All right. Okay, so that's really the task today. It's, it's, it's a time. So you have the rest of the time to uh, work on. Okay. And remember, whatever you don't finish is homework, and it's due Monday of next month. And if you don't want to work on it in class, you want to work on it outside of class, that's fine. Again, you don't have to stay here for the activities if you don't want to.